of in between that time of uh, heat stroke and frostbite, which, which I like. Uh, we're back on the heat stroke side of things, it seems like, this weekend. But I tell you what, last weekend, last Sunday night, weather was just perfect. And uh, we had uh, such a, gr a great gathering together, 250, uh, maybe more than that. There were so many people, so many cars out there last Sunday night that John took could not find his car walking back. He said it was worse than the Walmart parking lot. So, but what a, what a wonderful problem to have. And, and uh, I don't know if, if, you've, if you were able to see much of the PowerPoint, you walking in, I know you did not, but uh, just from the pictures, you can tell we had a great time, and thank you for the Martins for hosting that. Um, by the way, Jeremy, Kimberly, are you? The uh, Mr. and Mrs. Spice are available for rent uh, with their Halloween costume suits. Uh, that was really cool, by the way. Um, we want to tell the visitors we're so happy you're here this morning, and we know we have several visitors. Would you do us a favor? Would you fill out the, uh, the attendance card on the back of the pew in front of you? And uh, leave that in the collection plate as that goes by. We would like to have a record of your attendance and uh, hope that you will come back to be with us once again. Um, we have several on our prayer, prayer list as, as usual. And uh, please keep uh, your thoughts and prayers uh, for those families that's on that list. And uh, we also have a ton of information coming up that's uh, in your bulletins this, this morning. One thing I want to highlight um, we do have five Sundays this month, so next Sunday will be our special contribution Sunday, and uh, be thinking about that uh, as well. Um, you know, they say that uh, no one is content, and you may you may have a different opinion on that, but I've heard it said no one is content. Uh, I hope you have come this morning not content. I hope you have come desiring more and more of God this morning in your life as we praise Him together.
church. Our scripture reading will be coming from Ephesians 4, 25 through 27. Again, that's Ephesians 4, 25 through 27. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold.
pray with me, please. Our most gracious and divine Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We pray with humble hearts and humble spirits and humble minds to be here for multiple purposes, but the main purpose, God, is to worship you. And why do we worship you, God? Because of that last song. Because you are love. All through Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, reveals your love to us, your love for us, that even though we are sinners, you found a way out for us. You loved us so much that you sent your Son who died a cruel, cruel death with shame, all the shame of sin and guilt and remorse that has ever been committed by any person in the past, today, and in the future. All that shame, all that guilt, all that remorse was placed on him at one time. God, we thank you so much for that love you give us. God, also this morning as we pray to you, God, we know there are many in our presence and many in this church and many in our community and many throughout the world that need prayers of healing, prayers for those who have lost loved ones, prayers for those who are sick. God, we know we can always come to you in prayer. And we thank you so much for that avenue that we have. It is of utmost importance, God, that we look at you with reverence and awe. And God, we pray these things in Jesus' name.
22, 19. Jesus took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Later, Paul chastises the Corinthians in his first letter to them because they had already so quickly created divisions among themselves, and when they came together as a church, some would eat, some would get drunk, while others had nothing. Paul reminds them of the importance of unity in the remembrance of Jesus by repeating Jesus' words in chapter 14 and verse 24 when he says, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Last week, Steve mentioned that the congregation at North Heights in Batesville was strengthened by a series of tragic deaths. I think he used the phrase, they take care of their own. The funerals for those loved ones would have been somber and solemn occasions, as all funerals tend to be. Yet Steve described how the church was brought together in strength and unity because of their approach and love in the remembrance of those who had died. Because we remember Jesus during this time, we might say that our gathering on the first day of every week is somewhat like a funeral. Certainly he knew when he told the disciples that in our remembrance of him, we would also be strengthened. Adding to this, Paul stressed the importance of unity and focus in our remembrance. But the most important thing to remember in our remembrance of Jesus is that our weekly memorial service, if you want to call it that, is the fact that the one that we remember is not dead. He is risen. Those who we love that have passed from this life wait for their time to rise again. But Jesus has already defeated death, rose from the grave, and is with us always. Because of this, our commemoration is never a sad occasion, but instead a celebration of life, Sacrifice, suffering, death, burial, and most importantly, the resurrection of our Lord. Let's all be strengthened in our unity as we partake in our remembrance of Him. Father, we thank you so much for the remembrance of Jesus and the life that He lived, the sacrifices that He made, and Lord, that He rose again to save us from our sins. Father, be with us now, strengthen us. And let us focus and remember him in unity. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray for the cup. Lord, again, we approach your throne of grace thanking you so much for all that you have done, the sacrifices that you made, sending your only son to die for our sins. Father, help us again to remember him, strengthen us as we do so, and give us unity as we remember Jesus for all that he did. In Jesus' name, amen.
with me? Are we blessed? We're all blessed, aren't we? Got one amen out of that. All right. Thank you. We are all so blessed that if we undertook the task of creating a detailed, itemized list of our blessings, it could take hours, it could take days to create such a list because we are so blessed. So, let's add some filters to our list and shorten our list and possibly see just how great we are blessed. Let's remove the words, I have, I've got, and I am, and shorten our list and see what we get. Now, my results re revealed a very unorthodox list of blessings. So let me read those to you. Maybe you can share in that list. Eating when I'm not hungry. Sleeping when I'm not sleepy. Resting when I'm not tired. Going with no particular place to go. Donating clothes that I have never worn. Throwing food in the trash that is out of date. Living in a house that can be both warm and cool and dry. Every day in the warm months of the year, watching thousands of gallons of clean drinking water go down the drain at our local splash pad. So what does my blessing list reveal? One thing became very obvious. I'm not concerned about the necessities of life. That is a blessing. I'm not saying that's right or that's good but not being concerned about the necessities of life. I no longer pray as Jesus taught his apostles, give us this day our daily bread. Necessities, essentials. I find myself not praying for those anymore. I, I, I find myself not being thankful for those anymore because I take those things for granted. Like I said, I'm not saying that's right, but that's what my list revealed to me. And I realize there are many in this world, there are many in this state, there are probably many in this county, and maybe even some here in this congregation who do pray for their daily bread because they don't have the daily necessities that most of us have. So what should our attitude be this morning while we're giving? Jesus said, for those who are given much, much is required. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray this morning. I repent of my short-sightedness of your daily blessings. And Father, I realize how fragile the necessities of life can become so quick. COVID, COVID taught us that. And Father, I do pray for my daily bread for the necessities for food and water and shelter and clothing. The very air that we breathe today, Father, the environment that you have placed us in that allows us to exist, I realize that's all our daily bread. And Father, we 
pray this morning for those who are praying, that are in need. And we pray that our, our gift this morning, our, our offering, will come from a heart that desires to give. And Father, we pray that it will be used to further your kingdom and to help those around us. We thank you for everything, and we ask everything in Jesus' name. Amen.
have each one of you with us. I'm trying to discreetly scan the audience looking for the Myers, Will and a Harper. They're, I don't think they were to be here this morning, but I certainly don't want to miss the first time they're here with the new baby. Okay. Two weeks ago, uh, Daniel Parrish did an excellent job with the lesson he presented here. Amen? Wow. I think the, slo the title was this Life is a Slippery Slope, something along those lines. Uh, excellent, excellent lesson. Uh, I really appreciate the fact that Daniel did what I always ask these guys to do when they're speaking when I'm gone, and that is to go a little long. <laughs> go a little long. Uh, I got to find some way for people to appreciate me being back, you know what I'm saying? So that's the easiest way to do that, especially with a lesson like that. Uh, I told him that I'm going to, right at the end of the lesson this morning, I'm going to say, okay, just one more story. Okay, just one more. Excellent job. Very good job. I, I think hopefully all of us, I think we're all in the same boat here. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to put everybody in a bad spot. But... I feel particularly blessed uh, to work with this group of guys on the on the ministerial staff here at RNC. Uh, good folks who can present the Word of God and who are diligent in what they're striving to do. New series of lessons this morning over the next few weeks. Uh, I've entitled it simply, The Greatest Simple Challenges of the Bible. Uh, I need to confess, I lied to Tim. Uh, not all of you need to know this, but Tim needs to know this. Sorry, brother, I lied to you. Well, I didn't lie to you. I changed my mind. Is that different? Sometimes that's different. Sometimes we call it that when it's really just lying, right? Uh, but I, I, I thought better of the direction I was headed this morning and decided to do that more toward the end of this series. You know, some of the statements in Scripture, they're just so easy to read. And, and when you read them, you don't look at them and say, wow, I wonder what that means. Now, there are some things that we might look at and say, I, I kind of wonder what that really means. But the statements I'm talking about are not statements we read and say, I, I wonder what that means. I wonder how you put that into practice. The statements I'm talking about are those very simple statements. They're simple, but they're not always easy, right? In reality, the simplest things are oftentimes the more difficult things because they are just that simple. Uh, oftentimes, we tend, if we're not careful, to complicate the Bible because we won't admit its simplicity. You know, when you're talking about uh, the greatest commands, right? You know, folks who, who are really still uh, anchored in the Old Testament, say, well, you got the Ten Commandments. And yeah, you got the Ten Commandments. But Jesus gave two, right? And the two enveloped the ten. They summarized the ten. And they also summarized all according to the law and the prophets. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Love your neighbors yourself. It's about that simple. Most everything else will come into play under those headings. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. You may already be there, know where we're headed. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26 makes this very simple statement. It says, be angry and do not sin. Be angry and do not sin. 
Now, what that tells us is that it is possible to be angry and not sin. So we don't need to automatically assume that every time we're angry, that's sinful. Because it says, very, very plainly, be angry and do not sin. And then there's that following statement there that's, that's interesting. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, you're going to be angry. Don't let it sit there long. Because when it sits there long, it's going to cause a problem. If you keep feeding it, it's going to sit there and it's going to become a problem for you. So deal with it quickly. Uh, how many of you uh, went to uh, uh, a class taught by Dr. Neil Pryor? Dr. Neil Pryor, maybe in a lecture or, or maybe in a, in, a, in a Bible class at Harding. He taught for a, a generation. And he loved to tell a story about this verse. His wife's name was Treva. He'd always say it sort of like this. He'd, he'd read this verse and he'd say, now, Treva and I, when we first got married, said so we made an agreement. We made a pact that we would never go to bed angry. In other words, don't let the sun go down on your wrath, right? Be angry and do not sin. He said we made a pact that no matter how often or how many times or when in the day we got angry, that we would never go to bed angry. And you think, wow, that's good. And then he'd always end it this way. He'd said, sometimes it makes you want to stay up all night long. You know, that's always the way he would end it. And, and isn't that true? Isn't that true? You know, sometimes you, you know that you, when you're angry, you've got to let that anger go. You've got, to deal, you've got to do something with it. You've got to let it go. And sometimes you just want to hang on to it for a little bit longer. You, you, you're, you're kind of enjoying it. You're feeling justified in it. And you want to hang on to it for just a little bit longer. The context of this very simple statement. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such is good for building up as fits the occasion and that it may give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't give opportunity to the devil. What's the opportunity that the devil gets? The opportunity that the devil gets, it would seem in the context, is when you harbor your anger overnight. When you, when you grab hold of it and hold on to it too long. Anybody ever been guilty of that? We're all liars, aren't we? Oh, yeah, we, we know it. You didn't have to raise your hand because you knew you did it and everybody else in this room's done it, right? We, we, that's, that's, it's just human nature. It's, it's what we do. And if we're not careful and if we don't work at it really hard, we do it more often uh, than, than we should, which one time I guess is more often than we should. We're giving a foothold to Satan when we hang on to our anger. Dallas Willard said it this way, he said, feelings live on the front row of our lives like unruly children clamoring for attention, don't they? And feelings just jump out there. They just jump all over us. They make us feel warm and fuzzy. Well, not fuzzy, but warm. All right, maybe hot, okay? They overcome us. 
And it's amazing how they overcome us. And it's amazing the physiological changes in us when they overcome us, especially anger. Especially anger. Down in the end of, of uh, verse of Ephesians chapter 4 where I was reading, all the things you're to put away. Notice it says bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander. The word slander there is the word blasphemy. I mean, and it's the Greek, and that, that is the Greek word, blasphemy. It is a Greek word that we just simply adopted. But the one right before it speaks about anger that gets hot. You know, sometimes we're just a little upset, right? Sometimes we're just a little upset. And then sometimes we're like really upset really quick. Hot anger. And that list includes everything from the beginning to the end of that whole scenario, of that whole spectrum, if you will. Go back with me to Genesis. Genesis chapter 4. This is the story of Cain and Abel. Verse 3, In the course of time Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. It's been one of the things that's been debated since the beginning of time, at least the beginning of this scripture, and at least as long as this has been in print for anyone. What did Abel do better than Cain? Did he know what to do? Was there specific guidelines? I mean, Cain brought from, from what he produced. He was a tiller of the ground, right? Abel brought from what he produced. And there's a hint that it's very likely that God had said, bring an animal offering. Because it says he brought, Abel brought the animal offering, he says, and of their fat portions. I don't know about you. I'm thinking, if I'm just going to bring to the Lord an offering, I'm going to bring the animal, and I'm going to bring another boneless loin with me, okay? You know what I'm saying? You know, cut inch and a quarter, cooked medium, you know. I, I'm going to bring that. I'm not going to bring a little bit of fat unless, unless God said bring the fat because the fat represents that this is the best animal. This is the healthiest animal. And so at least the implication is that God had told him what to bring and Cain maybe didn't want to deal with his brother because that's what he would have needed to have done, trade some of his, uh, some of his crops for the, the right offering. And whatever be the case, Abel's offering was pleasing to God and Cain's was not. And it's telling what God says to Cain. The Lord said to Cain, he said, Why are you angry? Why are you angry? He's jealous, right? He's upset because he's jealous of his brother. He's angry that his brother did something right and he did something wrong. And what fault of that was Abel's? None, right? So the question comes, why are you angry? What have you got to be upset about? What have you got to be angry about? Verse 7, If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. There's the key for Ephesians chapter 4, back in Genesis chapter 4, and that is that the way you become angry and do not sin is you get control of your anger before it gets control of you. Because once it gets control of you, then sin is at the door. That's what he tells Cain. 
He said, you must rule over it. Did you ever hear of a story of someone getting arrested and, and, you, and your first thought is, why would you do that over that? And we think, you know, this person just gave up the next 20 years of their life over that? You couldn't get past that? Well, there's the problem. Set in court one day, Set in court several hours that day. I was with someone else. I was being support for them. Thank you for your suspicions. <laughs> this lady walks up to speak to the judge, and she is angry, and she let it be known she was angry, and he told her to go back and sit down. So her case got pushed. She went back and she sat down. She sat there, and she steamed, and she stewed, and when he finally decided he'd try her again, he calls her back up. She's got that same anger. She's bowling over the same way, and he said, okay, we're not hearing you at all today, and he put her case off. And you're sitting there thinking, she can't control her anger long enough to get a decent hearing here, and then it dawned on me. Now, I, I didn't go ask. I didn't want to get that close. But, but you know what, what came over my mind, right? You know what assumption I started making. But this, this is very likely a young lady who has never tried to control her anger. She's never tried to exercise it. She probably didn't have an example of how to do that. And this is the way she's living her life. And she's going from out of trouble to in trouble, back and forth. She's rotating through. She, she knew the ropes. She knew exactly where she was. This wasn't her first time there. It wasn't her first rodeo, as they say, you know. And I'm thinking, I'm probably witnessing someone who has never been taught and has never tried to control their own anger. And I ended up leaving that day feeling sorry for the lady rather than being entertained by her. I mean, it was entertaining for a while, I will admit. But I left that day feeling sorry for her because I thought that's probably who she's always been and doesn't know how to be any different from that. But we know how to be different from that, right? We're angry, but we do not sin. We don't let anger control our life. We don't let anger control what happens next. We self-talk, right? I hope we do. Do you self-talk? Do you, do, you, do you say things to yourself like, I'm sure they didn't mean that the way it sounded. Do you self-talk and say, you know, I really shouldn't judge people today because I'm kind of in a cranky mood myself. You know? Or maybe, maybe you just say, well, they're having a really bad day, obviously. I'm not going to let that influence my day. Or maybe you, you, you talk to yourself and say, well, maybe they're right. Maybe I, ought to, maybe I ought to apologize. You know, we do a lot of self-talk. But the key is to put anger where it needs to be put. Do with anger what needs to be done in the moment. And don't let it stay and don't let it do. Don't let it lead to sin, which it will, because it will. Go to James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. Really good. Uh, uh, another simple way of putting this. I could have put this uh, verse as, as the key verse easily enough because it goes to the same point. James writes, let every person three simple rules, right? Three simple rules. Isn't it nice when life's that simple? But it is that simple, isn't it? It really is. It's that simple. Be quick to hear. Huh? Isn't it interesting how that there can be nothing going on and we're in complete silence and we hear the first sound that, you know, makes waves around us 
and we didn't even listen to it. Somebody speaks to us and we say, huh? Because we weren't listening. We, we weren't set to listen. Be quick to hear. Oh, the next one's a big one. And the, and, the ne- and the second one really helps the third one, right? The second one is one that, that I've been working on. I, I, I have been working on this. I hope you've been working on it too, but I'm just saying I've been working on this one. And that is, be slow to speak. Just, just pause a minute before you comment. Just pause just a minute. It's amazing how if you'll pause just a minute, especially in a conversation where you didn't understand something and you're about to, you know, uh, embark upon a direction that the conversation is really not going, sometimes if you just be quiet for just a second, everything will clarify itself. It's amazing how if you're slow to speak, so oftentimes you won't. But a lot of times we just don't have that filter. We don't have that filter that says what I thought I heard was exactly what I heard and I'm going to react to it as if it was said emphatically and then we just automatically respond. And when somebody says, well, what was all that about? Well, I thought you said this, but I didn't. The next thing to say is, well, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Because it's not justified. It's not justified, right? We need a filter. We need a filter. Don't you wish we could buy them? If you could buy a filter, which filter would you buy? Which filter would you buy for your spouse? Is it the same filter? Slow to speak, slow to anger. Are those three things? Yes, they're three things. Be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. But you also see the progression, right? The progression is pretty obvious. If you are quicker to hear, you will be slower to speak. If you are slower to speak, you will be slower to anger. Because the one helps the next one. And the simplicity of that is just beautiful. We've heard it all of our lives, right? We've heard it all of our lives. I'm going to pick on you because I saw you nodding, Janet. Yeah. <laughs> Janet was going, and I know Miss Wilma right next to her. I guarantee you she's heard it all of her life because she's been teaching those kind of things all of her life, right? Sure we have. And that's good. That's wonderful. Notice the context around there for just a second. James chapter 1. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Yeah. Our anger doesn't result in the righteousness that God's looking for us. That's why he says, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. That's why he says, be slow to speak and slow to anger. Because the one does not produce the other. The one is counterintuitive. The one is counterproductive to the other. If you're wanting to live in God's righteousness, then you control your anger. And you learn to control your anger. Otherwise, it's going to be an almost uh, just pretty much an impossibility to live where you want to live and live like you want to live. Verse 21. There put, put away all filthiness and filthy, filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Be doers of the word and not hearers only. Somebody taught me this one in high school, but I loved it. I saw this on a sign 
in our superintendent's office at Tuckerman High School in whatever year that was. And yes, I was in the superintendent's office to support someone. <laughs> Not exactly. Be careful of the words you speak. Make them soft and sweet. Because why? You never know from day to day which ones you'll have to eat. And if you're going to be honest with people, you'll eat the words that you shouldn't have said. You will apologize for the words you shouldn't have said. You'll back up and correct the words that you've said that shouldn't have been said. Because that's just honesty. That's just being honest and truthful with one another. If we're not careful, the way we deal with angry words is we spout them out in the moment because we don't care in the moment because we were angry and we spouted them out. And the way we operate is that we let those things sit there and we don't do anything about them. We don't fix them. We let them sit there. And then a few hours later, we say something nice. And somehow in our minds, that makes up for them. And now we're all good again. Wrong. 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 Easiest way to keep from eating your words is to be quick to hear and slow to speak. Simple instructions in Scripture. In the end of James chapter 1, he says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only. How long have you been hearing the words of God? How long have you been going to church? How many Sundays have you been here in a situation just like this? Now, the shame of it is, and I'm not saying this just to be negative because I don't want to be negative. I'd much prefer not to. But oftentimes it will be the case that there are people who are going to church every Sunday morning that are harboring anger, not from yesterday because they didn't let the sun, they didn't, they failed to let and let the sun go down upon the wrath. It's because they've been harboring it for years and somehow feel justified in it because they've spent years ignoring some of the simplest statements of Scripture. You hear somebody say a lot of times, well, I've been a Christian for 25 years. And it's obvious that some people have been a Christian for 25 years because the maturity is obvious in them. But folks, we need to be honest with ourselves that if we're not careful, sometimes we've been a Christian one year, 25 times. We've been a first-year Christian 25 times because if you've been a Christian for 25 years and you haven't yet controlled your anger so much more and to such a greater degree than you had in the beginning to where that it's just everything but non-existent anymore then you haven't worked too much to control your anger he says be doers of the word not hearers only these words are so simple they're so straightforward. The simple challenges of the Bible that are the greatest challenges of the Bible, are they not? And right here in this same context, where he says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger, he implies that the reason you are not doing that well is because you are simply listening and not doing. You didn't make the transition from hearing to doing. Verse 22, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law of liberty, the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, 
He is blessed in what he is doing. Folks, our lives will be blessed. We will be blessed in what we're doing. We have the stamp of God's approval. We will have the stamp of God's blessing on our life and the way we live it as we become doers of these simple things more so than just hearers. And it's a challenge because it challenges, challenges us to be spiritual and not fleshly. And any challenge that is a flesh and spirit challenge is a great challenge. And it's something that requires work. And it requires time. And it requires commitment, right? Thank you for being here today. As we offer this invitation, as we sing this song, we simply offer it as an opportunity to lay anything that you need to lay before your church family this morning. Whether it's sin or whether it's struggle or whether it's hardship. Whether you want to lay it before the whole church, whether you want to lay it before the elders, or whether you want us to just pray for strength for you, whatever be your need, if you have such a need, we'd invite you to come as we stand, as we sing together, please.
Aren't you glad you came? Amen. You could have been anywhere else this morning, but you chose to be here. I'm thankful that you did. So many ways the world tempts you. So many world ways, the ways the world entices you. That seem more popular and easier to do, but you chose to be here this morning. I'm thankful for that. Uh, don't have any quotes this morning. Uh, I'm going to leave that to Steve. He comes up with good ones every week, and I can only do one, so I'm going to just leave it there. Um, I will say, though, that I, too, spent a lot of time in the principal's office supporting someone else <laughs> when I was in school. So uh, I understand that and appreciate that. People need support. Uh, I hope you heard it this morning. The, the Most of the time when I feel like I remember to be humble is when I wish I would have, when I wish I had... Uh, humbled myself because God, you can either choose to be humble choose to be humble or be humbled and uh, that was a good lesson Steve gave to us this morning it's uh, it's difficult, it's like he said simple but difficult, most of God's most of the things God asked us to do are that way but I'm thankful that he is that way and I'm thankful that Jesus was that way I can't imagine being in the garden or being on the cross and Jesus not being slow to anger I'm thankful for that. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we are grateful that you call us your children. We are humbled. Knowing, Father, that you've done so much for us, that you daily do so much for us, that we should be thankful for, that we should remember how you have blessed us daily. Father, you have given us this church home, this family, Father, who abounds in love, who serves, this family who reaches out to one another and reaches outside these walls as well, Father. You have blessed us so richly, and I pray, Father, that we remember that. You've blessed us with the forgiveness of our sins, Father. Help us in humility to remember that, that it is not we who save ourselves, but you who have saved us. You who have given us life, Father, who sustain us, who carry us day to day. And I pray, Father, that we remember that. And I pray, Father, that we will, even this day, be an example to those around us, those we come in contact with, living a life, Father, that makes them want to know you better. In humility, because we know that you have done this for us, and not we, not us ourselves. Father, we are grateful for this congregation and for the, for the way that you've blessed us. Also, Father, we're thankful for the giving of your son who you father who are so patient with us and could have chosen a whole different road father you chose to bless us with the opportunity to come to you to seek you and father we're blessed for it it gives us such a better life here and a life to come thank you father for allowing us to approach your throne to come to you with our our wants and our needs and our thanks. We pray, Father, for so many who hurt right now. We pray your comfort and your blessing on them. And I pray, Father, that we will be those that offer comfort and blessing to them. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for hearing us. We pray all this in Christ's name.